Proverbs. I wanted to take this opportunity. I was gone the last two weeks for vacation and wanted to thank Pastor Buddy and Brenda Williams for very well filling in. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Those of you who might be new or haven't been in a while, we are going through the Bible cover to cover in 366 days. And what we do is right before we are about to start a new book of the Bible that we're about to read in our own time during the week, we do a a short introduction. And so have you guys been enjoying the book of Psalms? It's really long. We haven't done an introduction in like three weeks because it's so long. But this week we are going to start reading the book of Proverbs. So you have your sheet, and it's also going to be on the screen if you'd like to follow along. Uh, The author of Proverbs, most of it is primarily Solomon, with sections attributed to the wise in uh, chapter 22, verse 17, and also Agar and King Lemuel in uh, chapter 31, verse 1. The date, uh, Solomon reigned approximately 970 to 930 B.C. The last two chapters of the book we have today in, in our current Bibles of Proverbs was copied by the men or staff of King Hezekiah. You see that in chapter 25, verse 1, who lived about 200 years later. The genre is the book is books of wisdom. We started with the book of Job and then the book of Psalms and now Proverbs, books of wisdom. They offer timeless insights and provoke contemplation about life's complexities. Exploring the themes of wisdom, ethics, and practical advice so that your choices will indeed be godly. A short summary of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs doesn't have a storyline. It's a collection of practical and essential sayings or tips for living a life of wisdom, wholly devoted to God. Underlying each proverb is the truth that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. A lot of them, even within a verse, can have almost two different subjects. And then there's also a few sections where eight verses or even longer will all be linked together for the book of Proverbs. A a quick synopsis, it's mainly written by King Solomon, as as I said earlier, the wisest human being who has ever lived. God said to Solomon in 1 Kings 3.12, just to remind us, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be. And so part of his wisdom was imparting to us these Proverbs. These Proverbs speak to issues such as using our words wisely, friendship, offenses, work and laziness, money, providing for the poor, the pursuit of pleasure and appetite, sex and temptation, drinking alcohol and gluttony, trials, the fear of man, marriage, discipline and parenting, being a son and daughter and giving to future generations. These are the main themes, but there's also all kinds of things that he touches because he speaks of all of life. The pursuit of wisdom is the main theme, and it's characterized by wisdom being a woman that you should go after, and it's contrasted with the woman you shouldn't go after, the adulteress. The final chapter of Proverbs, chapters 31, verses 10 through 31, includes a long poem in praise of wives, usually known as the Proverbs woman. This is rather unusual for its time and the culture that it was in. Last thing, since there are 31 chapters, you probably have already known this, but in case you didn't, uh, many have developed a discipline of reading a chapter of Proverbs a day, completing the book every month. So this is the book of Proverbs. I think you guys will do an incredible time in it, so enjoy. At this point in time, I'd like to ask Scott, where is he? There he is, you moved on me. Scott is coming up to give us a short exhortation. Give it up for Scott. Oh, sorry. Good morning. Learned last time that I can't.
hold my book in the microphone and do everything without a stand, so. Um, and a seat. So, um, <clears throat> back in January, uh, January 23rd, we read in Exodus, for those of you that were reading along in, the, in this series, uh, something that was brought back to mind to me this past week in some of the devotions I was doing. I just wanted to read it to you, and then I wanted to uh, suggest that you just take a minute to try to think about why God did it this way. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this day, way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. And then in verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the gr grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will f be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Then over to 17, he continues and said, The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And, they, and when they measured it by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. And so what I was reading this past week, I was trying to figure out, well, why would God do that? Where he would give it one, you know, every day you would go out and gather it. But if you kept it too long, it would rot. And then on the sixth day, he would give you twice as much so that you wouldn't be working on the Sabbath. That was kind of obvious. But why would he make it so that it would last one day? when at the end of the week it would last two days. And so what was impressed upon me by that is God wants us to be dependent on him each and every day and depend on him for everything that we need. And so that was a lesson that God was trying to teach the Israelites then. And then I started thinking, well, what are we doing right now reading through the Bible in 366 days? And so to me... The Bible is a great gift that God has given us, and it's a great gift to be known and to know our God, our Creator. And that's why he gave us the Bible, and that's why it's such a tremendous gift to us. And, and there's some promises in Psalms. It says, how can a young man keep the, his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord, teach me your decrees. <clears throat> and the way he does that, by us reading his word. And it says, I rejoice in following your statutes, as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees, I will not neglect your word. It's a constant reminder to stay within his word and to, um, to meditate it on it day and night. And then in Proverbs, which we should have started reading, I think it was yesterday, um, it says, um, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, Knowledge and discretion to the young. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And then over in Second Proverbs, it's, For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless, for he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. And then in Proverbs 3, he continues and said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. 
In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. And then he finishes in verse 13. Blessed is a man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. So that's, that's what I want to share this morning in an encouragement of um, the daily reading. And I would encourage you, if you've not been reading along in the readings so far this year, I, Proverbs is a great place to start. And just jump in, and that's a source of wisdom, wisdom and understanding. So that's what I think we're all searching for. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Oops. Well, good morning again. Why don't you guys grab your Bibles and turn to Psalm 103. Before we go on to other books in the Bible, I wanted to talk this morning about one more psalm. While you're turning there, this past Friday, so a couple nights ago, I had an opportunity. uh, I was um, blessed, in fact, to officiate a funeral in in Orlando. And um, after I spoke, a woman that I'd never met before. It was, I, I'm not even sure if she was family or friend or, of the deceased. I'm not sure. But anyway, she came up to me and she said, um, I just wanted you to know that your voice is so calming and so soothing. And I really needed to hear the quality of your voice because it calmed me down. And then she said, you really should maybe narrate a self-help book or something like that. And so I told her, thank you so much. You know, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard anything like that before. I really appreciate it. And then I kind of laughed because it dawned on me and I told her, this might be why some people in my church fall asleep. (laughs) So there's that. Psalm 103. This is a Psalm of David. Starting with verse 1. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Notice how many times he says all in just these two short verses. I want to read them again. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits benefits. He is making a decision to praise God. He's making a decision. Notice these first two verses. He's not speaking about his soul. He's speaking to his soul. He's not saying, my soul always praises. No matter what I'm going through, I find an opportunity to praise the Lord. He's not speaking about it. He's speaking to it. He is summoning praise from his soul. You could even say he's commanding his soul to praise. Did you know that you can speak to your soul? David does it all the time. That's one of the things we can learn from reading the Psalms. This one in particular, he is, I picture him like thumping his chest, like, come on soul, wake up. Doesn't matter what soothing voice you're hearing right now, wake up. It's time to praise the Lord. I also think of Job, a book of the Bible we read before Psalm, obviously. And in Job chapter 1, we, we learn that he, he loses everything. He loses his, his children. He loses his livelihood, his livestock. He loses everything that is important to him. And what is the first thing he does? He falls to his knees and says, Lord, uh, Lord you've given and you've taken away. Blessed be your name. To me, this is a picture of him speaking to his soul. Awake, come on, let's praise the Lord. Are we able to do that? Through the large things in our lives, a cancer diagnosis, a loss of job, a loss of a loved one, or the small things, we didn't get the promotion we wanted, or we didn't get the car we wanted, or we're not feeling very well today, we have sickness, we have COVID, we, we've got the flu, all of these things are obviously important to us, but are we able to praise God with everything? What does that even look like? What is our all? What's your all? What's my all? 
I think it includes our thoughts, our emotions, our prayers, our imagination, our fears, our doubts, our unbelief, our anxiety. It's all of it. There's a part of us, I believe, that I know it's a part of me. I, I, I can only speak for myself that it almost feels disingenuous to praise him unless I feel it. Have you been there before? This psalm says something different. It, it's about summoning and commanding our soul. Praise him with it all. All of it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Even the things that we kind of think, well, we're going to put this to the side because this really needs to be worked on. This doesn't glorify God, so why would I try to glorify God with it? He said our all. Can I give you a secret? The more we walk with God, hopefully, the more we look like him and sound like him and know him. That's called sanctification. But the reality of it is, We will never be perfect. We will never have all of our ducks in a row. We will never have everything in our lives and our thoughts that's pleasing to him. So does that mean we don't give our all until we can? If that's the case, we never will. We never will. God's all cannot be praised with less than our all. It's just, it's it's impossible He deserves our all, even our imperfections, to praise him. And in my understanding, and my walk with God, my imperfections don't get corrected until I turn them over to God in praise. My all. My acting as Job act, falling on my knees in the midst of pain and anguish and sorrow and and any other word you can think of that's going on in your life and saying, I give it all to you. I give my all. We tend to think of our all as all of our money. It includes our money. It includes our resources. We think of it as all of our time. It includes that as well. It has to. But we think of it in terms of what can I do for you instead of who am I for you? Our all is who we are. Again, the good, the bad, and the ugly the hurting, and the excited. David doesn't write this psalm out of a place of everything is hunky-dory, could not be better. If you read the life of David throughout Scripture, you see that he was constantly attacked, constantly had enemies coming against him, even his own son, Absalom, his own family turning against him. He went through a lot, and he's reading, or excuse me, writing these psalms from that place summoning his soul. I will praise the Lord. If we did this, and and even worked through the disingenuousness, if that's a word, worked through kind of the, the, the idea of fake it till you make it, realizing my all doesn't feel good enough. Again, I want to say to us, it never will be. But pressing through, to where we give our all because of his all. He continues this psalm with talking about why it's important that we give our all for God's all. Verse 3. Speaking of God, speaking of what his soul needs to praise, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. In other words, he forgives as judge and cures as physician. Now, can I tell you a secret? It's not a secret, but it might be to some of us. In this passage and most, most in Scripture, when it's talking about curing our disease, it's referring to spiritual disease. Can God heal the physical body 100%? By his stripes we are healed. But even that, primarily... He's talking about our spirit. See, our spiritual disease is so much worse than any cancer or, or illness that we can go through that is a disease to our physical body. Healing is available. We see that Jesus throughout his life healed and he said that greater things than these will follow those who believe in me. And they will lay hands on the sick and see them recover. It's important and it is a promise. But almost all of the promises in scripture of curing and healing is of the spiritual nature. 
because we're destitute, we're wanting, we're bankrupt, we're destitute spiritually. We have a thing called sin that is very much a disease, and it eats away at our soul, the very soul that we should summon to wake up and praise the Lord. He forgives our sins and heals all our diseases. Verse 4, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Man, what a picture that is. Who satisfies your desires with good things. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say satisfies your desires with everything. God is not this cosmic vending machine that whatever we want, we do the right thing, the right prayer, whatever, we place the coin in the slot, and he gives us everything our heart desires. Jeremiah says we should be careful about our heart because it's wicked above all things. No, it says, who satisfies your desires with good things, the things that we need, the things that, that are good for us even when we don't think they're good. This is the thing that we can't really wrap our minds around, our hands around, the concept of God being good to us by allowing us to continue to suffer. It's counterintuitive, but it's for our good, and therefore he grants what is for our good. I would say in the Christian walk, most of the time, his good feels good. But I would caution us, Sometimes his good doesn't feel good. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. This isn't an elixir. This isn't the fountain of youth. He's not talking about follow me and you'll look like a 20-year-old when you're 70. He's talking again spiritually. He renews our zeal. He renews our, our holy aspect of who God is and who we are in him. This is what he renews. It just so happens when this is renewed, our physical nature looks different too. Instead of frowning, we've turned that frown upside down because we realize how good God is to us. Verse 6. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. All the oppressed. The word oppressed means burdened by the abuse of power or authority. Now, we see this in our own daily life. Some cultures and nationalities see it more than others, certainly. But this idea of oppressed, pushed down based on a power or a force. Again, spiritually speaking, We're talking about by Satan and by temptation. The things that are literally oppressing us, weighing us down. We would call them perhaps addictions. We would call them maybe even um, depression. These are the things that he has died for us. These are the things that we summon our soul, wake up and praise him even in the midst of of these things. This is what true worship is. It's not singing a song, although it's part of that. It's not raising your hands or, or singing or dancing, although it's part of that. It's saying, my all is yours. And this is what David is teaching us, and it's coming from a lifestyle of doing it. Verse 7. He has made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. We've talked about this before, but I feel like a need to address it again. We tend to think of the Old Testament as being completely different. They only believed the law. Or if we understand that it was more than that, they, be- they believed that there was maybe some kind of concept or a foreshadow of a coming Messiah. The reality is they knew full and well if they knew God, who Jesus was as well. It says in John 5, 46, Jesus speaking, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. We think of the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible that we read a while back. 
We don't generally think of them like we do, say, the book of Isaiah that has all these prophecies of the coming Messiah. But everything he wrote about, the very nature of God, is in fact Jesus, and he knew full and well. So here, when it says, he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel, it's referring to the gospel, the very gospel that you and I accept and believe. And notice also that God made himself known. Only God can make himself known. I can help in that with my soothing voice. Others can help with that. Teachers and pastors and leaders and friends and associates and all those kinds of things. We can help make God known. We can make God known with our, the fruit of our lives. How we live our lives. How we glorify God. How we summon our soul to glorify God. But ultimately, only God can reveal himself. And another secret that is not well kept if you read scripture, he wants to be made known. Guys, we've all gone through this time where our soul is heavy, our soul is weak, our soul is is weepy. And we think God is a thousand miles away and he's not even concerned with helping me. The reality is that's not true. He wants to make himself known. Guys, if you're here today and you feel that way, or if you're watching online and you feel that way, that, that God's not near, God's not close, and he doesn't care to be, that's error. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's pursuing us. Maybe we're running. Maybe he's pursuing, but he hasn't caught up yet because we are continuing to run. Verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. Guys, I realize I have a tendency to repeat myself because it's important, I believe. This passage is all about him summoning his soul to praise God, okay? So even in this, he's summoning his soul. Remember how compassionate God is. Understand his character. Understand God's emotions towards us. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. This is a New Testament picture of an Old Testament God because he's never changed. What we think of the New Testament is still here in the Old Testament. God is compassionate. He is slow to anger. He is gracious. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Praise the Lord for that. I deserve death. My very best day deserves death, as does yours. And he gives us something different. 2 Timothy 1, verses 9 through 10, the Apostle Paul wrote, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it. It has nothing to do with what we've done or haven't done. We did not deserve it. But because that was his plan from the beginning of time. To show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Do you hear that soul? Do you hear that mind and emotion and will? This is the importance of reading scripture. It's not to read it to others, it's to read it to ourselves. It's to preach this to ourselves, to summon our soul to worship God with our all because of his all. The next verse, verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. This is the greatest distance known. It's so great that it can't be quantified. It cannot be measured because we can't see something that is spiritual. We don't know where heaven is. We kind of have pictures and and word pictures in scripture of it being above us. And we tend to look to the heavens 
we, we even say the sky is the heavens, but you can't actually see it, can you? Some have had this incredible vision of what heaven would look like. Isaiah comes to mind and others. But in other words, where we are to heaven, that distance is how great God's love is for us. In other words, it cannot be measured. That's how grand it is. That's how fantastic it is. That's why when I'm suffering and in pain, I can say, come on. I've got to give my all, even the, the all that is, is poisoned and, and flawed to God because of his love for me. The next verse, he says another measurement that's huge. Verse 14. No, verse 13. No, verse 12. I'll be there. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I brought a globe here to, to talk about this very illustration that is given in Scripture. He said, as far as the east is from the west. And by the way, any flat earthers in here are watching, um, centuries before it was proven with science, we have it in scripture that there has to be a round earth. I digress. So if you go north, you're eventually going to go south, right? If you go south, you're eventually going to go north. But if you go west, you continue to go west. Even over countries that we call the western hemisphere, or the eastern hemisphere, when you go west, you always go west. If you go east, you always go east. You never turn to go west if you're going east. That's the idea. When we sin and we actually repent, we say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I don't want to do them anymore, and we turn from them. Our sins is as far as the east is from the west. In other words, they're gone. Another passage in the psalm says he throws them in the sea of forgetfulness. The idea is this measurement that is larger than could ever be measured because it never stops. That's how far our sin is. That's why I can say, struggling as I do with temptation, struggling with thoughts and depression or anything that I'm going through, come on, soul, praise him. Praise him for who he is. Praise him that I'm not destroyed. Praise him that I've got breath in my body. Come on, praise him. My sins are forgiven. They're as far as the east is from the west. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, if we truly repent, then it's as far as the east is from the west. Guys, that means the burden that we feel, the sorrow, the, the, uh, the guilt that we feel from the things that we've thought or the things that we've said or the things that we have not done that we should have is gone. It's removed. It's removed. I think we've come so accustomed to that that it's not surprising. It's not awe-inspiring to us. We've lost track of who God is. I realize I'm not in a church that hoops and hollers, but my God, guys, our sins are gone. We lose track of that. It's just part of what we believe, but our sins are gone. Let that amaze you again. Tell your soul, that's amazing. I don't have to be guilty. I don't have to be down on myself. Come on, guys. I know I've got a soothing voice, but <laughs> verse 13. Verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Those who fear him is said three different times in these, this psalm, Psalm 103. 
Three different times he says, those who fear him. This is the second time that he says it. What is he saying? I want to read it again. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. In other words, not just presumptuous sinners expecting it. Guys, the truth of the matter is, when we turn to God and turn from our sins, i.e. repent, we have a, a promise in Scripture that we will be forgiven based on his faithfulness. However, if we think that it's just a natural law, like dropping my glasses and gravity takes over, we are mistaken. There must be true repentance, i.e. fear of God. An awe of who he is. We've lost it. I've lost it. We've got to regain it. Soul, be amazed at our God. Verse 14. More reasons to, to just be thankful. Again, things that we tend to just, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I know that. But let's become acquainted with them again. Verse 14. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Thank you, God, that you remember I'm nothing but dirt. Guys, I'm not talking down on myself or down on you, but it's the truth. We are really nothing without his breath into our nostrils. And God knows that. He's not expecting me to be him. He's expecting me to follow him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place remembers it no more. Our lives are fleeting. They're, they're like a vapor, James says. They're just here for one minute, really, in the, in the term of eternity. And they're gone. He knows who we are. Let's flesh that out a little bit. He knows our frailty. Not just frailty of humankind, those of us who wear this earth suit, but your frailty. My frailty. Physically, spiritually, emotionally. He knows the corruption of our nature. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus was sin, or that, that he was tempted, excuse me, yet without sin. Tempted with every temptation we will ever be tempted with, yet without sin. He knows me. He knows you. Not just the dressed up wearing Sunday go to meet and close, Sean. He knows the Sean that I don't want anybody else to know that I'm ashamed of, that I'm afraid. Somebody might get a glimpse of. He knows that. He knows us better than we know ourselves by far. He knows the corruption of our nature. He knows that we are prone to sin. He knows that right now on Sunday morning we're listening to a message and, and we're praying and we're wanting to get our lives right and when we go out the door, we do something wrong, we think something wrong, we do not follow him the way that we promised him five minutes ago we would do. He knows that we are prone to do that. He knows our mental and our spiritual and our emotional makeup. He knows how we think. He knows how we'll respond. He knows when we should respond and we don't respond. He knows the things that we struggle with. He knows the thoughts that we have. He knows the dreams that we have. He knows the fears that we have. He knows our weaknesses. Weaknesses that all humanity have, but also your specific weakness that's just a little bit different than everybody else. He takes that into the equation because he's God. The God that we should tell our all, worship him, praise him, give your all to him. Guys, this is again not just about Raising your hands and, and having a louder voice when you sing. It's about giving your all, turning everything over to him. The flawed stuff, the ugly stuff, the great stuff. He knows our fears, our thoughts, our dreams. He knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. Let's finish this psalm. 
verse 17. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. The third time, those who fear him. And his righteousness with their children's children. With those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. I'm saying to my soul, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom, his domain rules over all. All things, good and the bad, the things that we're struggling with, the things that, that we're ashamed of, the things that we can't get over, the things that are, have offended us. He's king over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He bookends this psalm. Psalm 103 starts, verse 1, with praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He ends it with the same thing. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He's speaking to his soul, to his mind, to his heart, to his will, to his emotions. Praise the Lord. I praise you with everything that is within me. I want you to stand, please. I want to lead you in prayer, but I just want a few moments that, I'm just going to warn you right now, will probably feel awkward to you. They're going to feel like it's two hours instead of two minutes. But I want you to speak, whether you, you it's up to you if you want to do it out loud or to yourself. But I want you to summon your soul. And, and this can't just be a Sunday thing. This, for me too, this can't just be a way we respond to a sermon. This is the way we respond to scripture, i.e. we respond to God. Heavenly Father, Lord, show us the, the impact of this psalm. It's not just the next thing we read or the next thing that is up on a Sunday morning for us to study together. Lord, you impressed by your Holy Spirit upon David to write these words to him, to those in his time, and to us in our time, to me this morning. Lord, I give you my all to the fullest capability that I'm able to do so. With my fear of man, with my fear of, of what could come, fear of, of rejection, fear of anything, disease, pestilence, anything. My doubt, or, is this true? Is this not true? Are you really the God of, of Scripture? And, and where are you? And why don't I feel you all the time? And and when I feel really close to you and, and I feel like you're speaking to me and when I don't, all of it wrapped together, my, my heart that is pure and my heart that is calloused, all of it, my all, my current state, I give to you right now. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Thank you for your all that you gave. Thank you for your all that you always give. You continue to give. You're giving right this second and you will the second after it. With all that I am, I praise all that you are. Now in your own words to God, do the same. To your own soul, do the same. Praise your holy name. 
praise you, God. Praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So that means we've got to go from here the same way we're leaving here, right? Amen. Myself included. I'm not speaking to you without a mirror in front of me. When I read scripture, it shows me the things that I need to do just as it shows all of you. Are there any announcements? Uh, this coming Monday night, we have men's life group here at the church at 6.30. Is there anything else that I need to announce? Oh, Celebration of Life for Jerry and Jane Francis will be Tuesday the 30th, July 30th at 10 a.m. at Life Point Church. We will be uh, doing the service, but they felt like they needed a bigger church, a bigger building to house everybody that would be coming. Those of you who know Jerry and Jane and love them, you would understand that certainly. Um, but would love for everybody who's possibly able to come to, to come. Is there anything else? Priscilla Shire simulcast will be Saturday, August 24th at 9 a.m. This is to be viewed at home. We're not going to be doing it here at the church this year, but that stuff is available at lifeway.com. All right. Keep reading. Keep loving God. Love each other. Love you guys.